On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, we talk with Michael Lander, MSW and psychotherapist, about acceptance and commitment therapy, third-party objectivity, knowing a child's process, and collaborative problem-solving with kids. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, everyone. With me today, I have Michael Lander. How are you? I'm doing great today. Brandon, thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for being here with us today. And for those that don't know you, you are a MSW. What does that stand for, Michael? Master of Social Work. That is correct. You're also a psychotherapist with a specialty in children, youth, and families. Your drink of choice is a single shot Americano in a small cup, everyone. Yes, I know Michael from the coffee shop. Um, That's where we met. And we got to talking. I learned about you, your practice, And you are based in Toronto, where I am. All of your information will be in the show notes. Did I say that correctly? I was thinking too fast. I think so. Okay. And so today we're going to talk about children, abuse, and parenting. Uh, We went through an outline uh, discussing something called acceptance and commitment therapy. We are also going to talk about dealing with your ex or co-parent and strategies with that. And we're going to discuss collaborative problem solving with your kids. This is going to be a really informative episode. I was educated by you the other day, and I only really got a little tiny glimpse of uh, what we were going to be talking about today. So a really big thank you for, for doing this. I'm doing this with you in person, which is a real big treat for me. So... Again, thank you uh, once again, Michael, for for doing this. And let's start off with what is acceptance and commitment therapy? Yeah, I mean, I think that acceptance and commitment therapy, the way that I've been trained in it, is um, that it's a modality of therapy designed for uh, problems that can't be changed. Um, and so um, a lot of therapy is about finding solutions to your problems but what what do we do when there's a problem we can't change um let's say someone has died someone is sick something is happening that we actually can't change so um what we really want to change is our relationship to that issue uh and part of that one of the big pieces is acceptance um and so i think we were talking a little bit about like bringing that into my work with children about talking about talking to children about the distinction between problems you can change and problems you can't and what to do in both regards. So we also discussed the child's process and um, understanding the child's process and then how important that is for a parent um, when uh, you know when they get the child back from dysregulated. Uh, is that the proper word? Dysregulated parent. Um, and w- so what does that mean? And how would you go about this process as a parent when uh, dealing with a child? Yeah, I mean, I, I see that a lot in my practice. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of families where one parent, yes, is dysregulated or has a history of abuse, treats the kids wrong. Uh, is completely self-absorbed, all these kinds of things. And then the kids have their visitation for the weekend and then they come back home. And usually they're going to dad's and then they're coming back home to safety at mom's. I got to say, typically that's the way it goes. Um, not always, but typically. And and so, you know, I think that a lot of parents have this question of like, what do I do when they get home? What do I do when they get home and everything is in disarray? Um, and they are now dysregulated and they can't control themselves. And so I talk to a lot of people about like really getting to know your child's process for working through um, like f- for working through some of those emotions and for getting themselves back to a regulated 
place. You know, every, we all have our process for how we recover from dysregulated environments or um, big feelings, as I would describe it with kids, you know, and, and we sometimes it takes a day, sometimes it takes three days, sometimes it takes a night. Um, but usually over the course of our lives, we get to know what do I need after something hard. And so really, I think it's important to get to know your own child's process um, for how, how, what they need after they come home. And different kids need different things. But I think, um, you know, one thing that's really important is giving them a lot of time to settle without demands right away. Um, I guess give me a scenario of a parent noticing a child's process and how a different one specific child would process and um, how they would go about the observation, realizing what calms them, and then uh, moving forward from there of like, okay, this is what it is. Now I can create my own plan around this. Mm, that's a great point. I mean, I think an example that comes to the top of my mind is like really a, a family with, with two boys who were going to visit their dad and their dad was incredibly verbally abusive, emotionally abusive, manipulative, blamed mom for everything to his boys when they were there. Um, so they would come home and all of a sudden, not only would they be emotionally dysregulated and in pain, but they would be all of a sudden upset at their mother for little things they would just blow up at her because they had just come from a weekend of someone blaming their mother for everything, which wasn't justified. And and so one kid needed to talk about it right away. One kid needed to vent and get it all out, and then he could get over it. The other kid needed to sit with it for a while, needed to not talk about it, distract himself, sleep on it, and then the next morning come, like, he would make his way to his mom and then they would talk about it and and that would help but but the mom had to understand that these two boys needed different things when they got home and if you were to push one to do one thing and the other to do the other thing it would continue the cycle of dysregulation and so this mom got to know her son's process and then over time she made a plan that every time they got home she would sort of like enact this plan and it would be one kid goes over here while the other kid comes with me and talks with me. And so each kid gets their own plan for the next sort of like 24 hours and we do what we need to do to sort of process what just happened. Um, you know, a lot of these kids don't want to go visit that other parent, um, but don't have a choice. Yes, we want to rescue them from a situation that they really shouldn't be in and don't want to be in. But if we can't rescue them from that situation, we got to work in reality and we got to let them know that as frustrating as this is, it is the reality. And, and from there, what are we going to do? So it's not about avoiding reality and being like, okay, you're home, everything's fine. No, it's like, no, you're home and that was really hard and we're going to face that together. I think that's important. So a lot of parents are dealing with abusers. They're dealing with people that have a disorder of some sort. They're dealing with a co-parent that does not want to co-parent. So what are some strategies that the parent can use um, when it comes to working for the kids when another parent is actively working uh, against you? And can you give uh, some examples of uh, different situations of how a parent would act uh, against someone in these situations and how you would counter parent in, in those situations? It's a very good question that doesn't have an easy answer. Um, and I think that you know, and in so many cases, it calls for different things. But I think that um, kids, no matter what age, um, should be let in on the conversation of what's actually happening. So what is the dynamic between parents? Who's mad at who? Who's blaming who? Kids understand the blame game. They're the masters at it. 
You know, you get a kid in trouble and they will immediately blame everyone around them. And so they understand that it's a tactic. And if you ex- if you talk to them about one of their parents um, doing that, I think kids are in the best position to understand where some of that blame and that need comes from. It's usually the result of a deep insecurity. It's usually the result of being mad at oneself, um, of, of feeling bad about oneself. Um, and, and kids get that. And so, you know, I'm not just of the camp of like, uh, mommy and daddy are fighting, but it's okay. Everything's fine. Sometimes it's like explaining a bit of the dynamic in like appropriate language for a child. And just to explain to everyone, we're talking here about um, the relationship between the acceptance and commitment therapist and the child, and it's and it's their conversation. Uh, that Michael is discussing here. So when you are talking to kids from uh, abusive families, how do you get around the blame game? Because I know that's a, a, like a big problem for for parents is you don't want to blame the the other parent for what's going on. So how do you go about it? Or do you have any examples of you going about it? I was taught this summer, I was told by a 12 year old, an explanation is not an excuse, which to me was very poignant, very wise in that you can explain something without excusing it. Um, And I think that that is something very important here. Um, To explain with empathy, and with understanding what is happening. Some of the deep pain that people are in, and this is why they're acting the way they act. This is why they're lashing out. I'm not excusing their behavior. We are not excusing their behavior or saying it's okay. And we're not completely blaming them for everything that's wrong. In fact, by explaining what's going on, we are taking a bit of the blame from them and placing it in sort of the human experience so that the blame isn't your parent the a little bit of that blame is like what your parent is going through and this is how a person reacts when they're going through that and it's not okay um and so let's talk about how to talk to your parent how we can talk to your parent about it or how you can ask for it to be a little bit different when you're at their house like so like living in reality. So so give me an example. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, an example of that would be, um, you know, a, a father who was um, constantly putting down his son who would go visit him. The parents were divorced. Mom and dad were or separated, going through custody battle. Um, dad had a history of abuse. Kids would go and... One one of the kids would be constantly put down by the dad. You know, the dad had his own history of abuse. He was very severely abused by his father. And that was clear, you know, in my work with the dad, that was clear of how that was sort of coming down the generational line. And this kid who would come home having been, you know, really, really brought down by his father, um, kept it all inside. Uh, would just cry about it, right? Uh, when he was alone. And no one really knew what was going on. Um, and when we finally knew what was going on, you know, then we had to decide what to do about it. And are we just going to, like, v- blame the father for being an asshole? A little bit. And in my own mind, sure. Um, but But to this kid, I wanted him to get a sense of the bigger picture of like maybe why his dad is acting that way and maybe what types of conversations could help his dad recognize why he's acting that way. And this isn't for the kid to have those conversations, but it's for the kid to be involved in those conversations um, and to know the different factors at play. 
So these are conversations more for you or for the therapist to have with the child. And, um, you know, giving him explanations or giving this, the child explanations of what's happening. I guess that would be able to, I would assume, uh, my dad acts this way or explained his way of why he does this because of that. I don't like how that feels. And when he does that, I understand how it came to be. B, I, I don't like how that feels. And is that a way for him to, or I'm using him because of the example, but um, is that a way for this child to process it and then know that it's not a correct behavior and to not, re- are you trying to not have them repeat the generational trauma cycle as well? That's the, that's the key. That's one of the keys is for this child to understand um, what's actually happening here as opposed to like, you know, what daddy's doing is not okay and he's treating you badly and it ends there. Um, that no, it's, it's, it's more than that. And we want this child to understand a little bit about that so that they are modeled, like so that they um, notice their own place, that they have awareness within their own place in that, in that pattern and in that dynamic. Um, and uh, you know, I really want to stress that I'm in no way excusing the parent's behavior to the child. And I'm, I'm constantly telling the child, like, this is not okay, but I do want their like a little bit of understanding radar to be on to, to, to know kind of what's going on because empathy helps a person have generative conversations that lead towards solutions. So I'm not telling kids to go and like talk to your dad about the, the abuse and their abuse, but, but I, but I do have in the back of my mind that like one day organically that conversation is going to come up between this dad and child. So that's a process that can be done with you. Is there a process, you know, not everyone can afford, um, therapy. And they're going at it alone. How does someone, is there a way that someone can do that alone when it's not coming from uh, the other parent? Or does the other parent have that ability? Or is it, you know, that seems a little bit more difficult because you being a third party, there's a different level of um, trust going on. Because you're fair and objective. Somewhat objective. Um, But also... When I'm with a family, I'm working for the child. And in that way, I can center my work on their needs. And that's pretty powerful. But I'll put that aside for a second and just say, like, um, first of all, I, for many years, I've worked in the public system, so I didn't cost any money. Um, there are good um, publicly funded therapeutic services, at least in Toronto. Um, but also it becomes a really tricky thing when it's one parent versus the other, when you don't have a third party. So I can talk about that in a second, but I also maybe want to stress the importance of a third party, of a person who works for your child and framing it like that. So that within this dynamic of two parents that are at war, which so often happens, um, you know, who, who, is objective. Neither of those parents are objective. They just can't be. Um, even if one is more like quote unquote right than the other or in the right, they both are seeing it through their own point of view. And the child is going to hold back certain things to protect that parent. And they're going to agree with one parent to make that parent feel good and agree with the other to make that one feel good. So I, I, I do want to stress the importance of having like a third party, a stranger who is just there to act on behalf of the child because when a child feels like they have that, um, they're much more likely to, to, to show what they're actually going through. So having a child uh, work with a third party is extremely important, but when it comes to being a proactive parent, 
how does a parent become a collaborative partner with uh, the child? How do they become part of the child's uh, team? That's a really, really good question. And I think that, you know, I think that one of the things is, one of the key things is learning how to ask children questions. And then from there, learning how to share language with them. So, um, you know, one thing that I would say is, you know, kids, we often think that kids are man, like little kids are manipulating us. So parents will often say, my child is manipulative. They know how to get what they want. Um, they are actively manipulating me, right? We hear that all the time. I think and a lot of researchers think that that is bogus. A lot of clinicians think that that is um, that is a misnomer and is blaming kids for th- for something they're actually not doing. So, so um, there's some like there's a very well known neuroscientist uh, and psychologist Russ Harris who who believes that um, child who writes that like children are not manipulating you. Children are want what they want. And have no idea that their behavior is to get what they want. So they are doing their best. Like, they don't know what they're doing. They're not intentionally manipulating anyone. They don't realize how, like, when, when they want something, they have a tantrum and then they get the thing. They don't realize they're doing that, but they are. So if you see a kid as manipulating you intentionally, you're going to treat them very, very differently than if you see a kid as 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 like doing their best to meet their needs and not having the skills to meet their needs. So a kid might want a thing and not have the skills to ask for it. Um, so instead, they cry and then they get it that way. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that parents can do when they notice a lot of that behavior is trying to get to the bottom of, what is going on for that kid? And kids don't have the language. So parents often make this mistake of asking their child a question. The child goes, I don't know. And the parent goes, well, then what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to help? My child won't talk to me. What they don't realize is that child actually doesn't know. And that child doesn't have the articulation skills to tell someone what's actually going on for them. So they answer, I don't know. So sometimes you have to um, guess for them. You have to give them options. You have to give them words for what you think they're feeling. And then you let them correct you. You let them agree or correct you. And in fact, give them a few options, some that might be a little wrong, so that they go, no, it's not that. It's actually this. You know, so you're asking questions, not just like, are you mad because this is, uh, you're saying like, it looks to me like you're acting this way because you're wanting something and can't get it and it makes you angry. So you get really upset. Like, is that what's going on for you? And then, and then a kid can think about it and agree or disagree. And when that kid responds to you with what's going on for them uh, and they use words, so let's say they correct you and they say a sentence, one of the most important things for a parent to do is to use those exact words when speaking back to them. Um, It's something that's overlooked. It's something that's not really talked about. But it's one of the most powerful therapeutic tools you can use is when someone tells you something and you write down the exact words, and you repeat it back to them with a question, Um, it's like the brain feels like so seen. So give me an example of repeating it back with a question. Um, Use me. I'll be the child. (laughs) Wait, I I have to think. I have to think. Um, While you're thinking, I just want to say that... From our conversation yesterday, you know, what you just said of how you are talking to children and finding out what their feelings are and the way you go about it, 
I think I explained it to you yesterday that, um, you know, you know, I do that. And the way I was taught to ask questions sometimes was not to be correct and to get your ego out of the way. Because when you ask the wrong question, um, when you're asking someone about what they're feeling, the other person will want to clarify you being wrong. And instead of getting the answer of just, hey, I was sad, they might go, no, I wasn't um, jovial. I was actually this, 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 and this. And then they really want to explain their feeling more than just one word. And they'll go into a depth of that. And then I always say to people who are going to be guests on the show, the more you can explain your feelings and to the depths of what those feelings are, you're giving language, but you're not just giving language for yourself. You're giving language to the people who are listening that haven't been able to understand what their feelings about the situation are yet. And now you're connecting a visual picture and your feelings of something they went through, and now they can communicate it to somebody else. And I think that is so important. And you never think about doing that for kids. I never even thought about it until you just really said it now. That's so interesting. It's so interesting that that's like a strategy that you use to elicit like much deeper emotional responses and for people to actually search their brain for what's going on. You know, you want, you want to get people thinking, you want to get those kids who are saying, I don't know. You want to, you really want to be like, that makes sense. You don't know. Um, but if you think about it, um, what's something that comes to mind? Or like, if you imagine that you did know what would be a little piece that you knew about it. So, you know, to go back to your question a little bit about, um, like using shared language, you know, so there's, there's, there's a few different examples. One, one would be like, let's say a kid was like, I'm, you know, when this happened, I was feeling like alone, kind of stupid, ugly, and like totally weird, right? So I would write those down maybe, or I would hold on to those in my mind. And I would say like, is there a time in your life where you have felt like alone and kind of stupid, and totally weird? And then you, you sort of got through it. How did you get through like that time when you were feeling alone and kind of stupid and totally weird? And, and then, and then, and then that's like, that's like a hook for a kid to, to, to be like, oh, that person completely gets what I'm going through, you know, because you've used their exact words. Um, and then they can search back and go, oh yeah, there was, and they can talk about it like that. Or the flip side of that would be to, to say like, uh, a t like, you know, talking about a, a time when they were, they were feeling good or some things that they were feeling good or, or something they're wanting, you know, like I'm really wanting to like lower my stress levels and like find a way that I can, that I can like come home and actually feel fine. So it's like, okay, so imagine a day where you had lower stress levels and you came home and you actually felt fine. What, what would you have done that day? Like what would be some things on that day that would lead you to lowering your stress levels, coming home and actually feeling fine. So in that way, you're getting them to think about things, what they're going through, but with their language. And I think that that's something that kids and especially like, you know, for kids with parents who are preoccupied with their separation or going through things, these kids really don't feel like anyone's on their side. And they don't feel like they're on anyone's side because they're pulled in too many directions. Um, so the power of of getting on their side, of really um, joining with them, it's really, really powerful stuff. And are there any books for a parent to read about collaborative problem solving with a child? I would read the book, The Explosive Child. And it talks about a lot of things. But it's really about how to ask questions in that way, how to um, share language with children, and then how to involve them in solution building. Um, so 
compromising within solution building, which maybe seems straightforward, but allowing them to have a voice and a say in what they think the solution to their issue will be. Even if it's not really going to be a solution, giving them that choice in the matter and integrating their solution into the larger solution of being like, yeah, let's do that. We're also going to do my idea of doing this thing. Let's do both their ideas at the same time and see how it goes together. That's the sort of collaborative problem solving approach so that the kid feels like their way of solving this problem has the same weight as their parents way of solving this problem and that they're really working together. So before we end off the show, um, I guess a lot of parents, there's going to be no answer to this, but it's just going to be more of your opinions of of the situation because there is no winning in the court system um, and how the system works. So for those parents who are having a very hard time within the system, um, which is not fair, uh, what would you say to them and to keep on kind of going, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, there's so many people who are caught up um, within the court systems. And from my experience, and I'll be honest, um, there are so many women who have come forward about abuse perpetrated by their ex-husbands that is not taken seriously in the courtrooms. And that is seen as a technique to gain custody and therefore is not taken seriously. And I've seen it time and time and time again. I know that lots of people have other experiences with the system and see maybe the flip side, see a lot of men being treated very poorly by the system um, and alienated and pushed out. And I think, and so it's, it's kind of a hard one to navigate. Um, But in my experience, I've seen so many mothers who are caught in the system of trying to um, break connection between an abusive father and the child and can't. And the child is begging for it and they can't do it. And so what we talk about there would be A, survival strategies. So how to survive something. Um, And there's different strategies within that notion of survival. And kids can sort of understand survival strategies, how to get through something hard, how to sort of put your head down and get through it when you have to, which is kind of a shame. And then we talk about acceptance and commitment. Um, So acceptance alone is a passive state and doesn't feel very good, but acceptance coupled with commitment and By commitment, I mean a commitment to living by your own values, by aligning your behavior with your values, and doing small things every day that are in line with how you want to live your life. That commitment can ease the weight of accepting something that is hard and painful and that you don't want but is the reality. And so we talk about, so so that goes for parents. If you're in a situation that it's so messed up and the system is screwing you over and everything's wrong, like do everything you possibly can to make that situation better. But there also has to be some acceptance so that you can have some energy um, to live your life. And the same thing goes for the same thing goes for children um, that, you know, if you, if you have a home situation that is not good and right now there's nothing we can do about it, um, then we got to talk realistically about like, what can you do in your life that does make you feel good? And if you are able to bring some acceptance to this home situation, to let it be what it is for a second you might be more able to have some energy to live the rest of your life. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question. Oh, no, I think that was more than what I asked, really. So thank you. You brought it all the way back around 
to the acceptance and commitment like it began. So it's a good place to finish. And, you know, I just really want to thank you for being here with me today. This was a really helpful episode for so many people who this is a good starting point for a lot of people to make these changes. And uh, I really can't thank you enough for inviting me into your home to do this uh, with you today. So thank you. Thank you. This has been a huge pleasure. So a big thank you to Michael once again. All of his information and all the information from the show, including the book that was mentioned, The Explosive Child, will be in our show notes. And if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At the top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our guest form page on our guest form page we have lots of instructions so please do read all the instructions and send us an email at narcissistapocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button and please send it to us in the form that our uh, instructions say also at our website, we have our very own social network. It's our support group. So at NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page, there's a button that says support group. When you click on that button, it takes you to our support group. And inside, we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Saturday night, and Thursday afternoons. We have forum boards for you to post and for people to answer those posts for you. So you can get all the information from your peers that are going through the same thing. On there as well, we have ad-free episodes and episodes that never made it to air. So please do join our support group today if you need support. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. At domesticshelters.org, you can, a- you, you can access free resources there, uh, articles. You have uh, numbers and websites for shelters and domestic violence agencies. So please do go visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. And that is it for today. So from myself and Michael Lander, we hope you have a good night.